obstetrician, Dr. Afriye Amerson, to the show. Welcome her. How are you? Thank you so much. I have a seat for a second. Because you know what? I have these three moms that are here that all have questions. And I thought, you know what? I better bring in somebody, the big guns, to see if I can help answer some of them. You gave birth the first time 15 years ago. Yeah. So, uh, Definitely. But it's, um, it's all new. All new. So all the things have kind of changed, or have they, Doc? Actually, things have changed drastically in the past 15 years. More C-sections, I know that for a fact. Why is that? C-section is safer and safer and safer. The infection rate for surgery is going down and down and down as we learn how to control bacteria and how to prevent infection. Okay. Secondly, the risk to the child. When I was born, one in 200 infants, Montel, would die. Now, one in 20,000. I'm a new grandmother. My grandson is 18 months old, and he's very energetic, and me being the age that I am, <laughs> it's kind of difficult for me to try to keep up with him. Any recommendations? How old is he again? 18 months. 18 months old, you can do just very simple things that move from one end of the floor to the next, like a relay race, and that's good for you too. Back and forth, and back and forth, back and forth, and then we'll have a child that sleeps well at night. Yes, ma'am, you had a question. Actually, I have a question about, I have a four-year-old and a 15-month-old. The four-year-old is definitely expressing some hostility. You don't want to get in the habit of simply punishing the four-year-old for hurting the younger 15 month old because that will actually foster the resentment. If instead, every time the four year old, if it's 30 seconds of good behavior, you've got to jump in there and say, what a fantastic big brother. Something that they would want to be proud of and want to be. So you're really, you're reinforcing the best. I have been in private practice now for seven years as of this summer and so my duties include complete women's care and I take care of uh, adolescents. I do surgery on women, of course office care and counseling and obstetric care which is the most fun, bringing newborn life into the world and caring for the pregnancy and the time after the delivery. I was treated for an eating disorder. An eating disorder and pregnancy are not mutually compatible. And it places the pregnancy at high risk. We will be doing a few tests today and we'll be following these results as you move through the pregnancy. She already is completing one of the three trimesters of her pregnancy. So starting off with self-destructive behavior and moving through one trimester in that fashion greatly affects the baby's ability to have the cells expand. The brain and the spinal column have developed already. And so it is the time for her to put her body in a position of sustenance. Secrets will be revealed. Emily's family discovered her dangerous eating disorder, but that's just the beginning. Now she tells her dad the biggest secret of all. My helper, right now. I come to you, she's not here. I'm a father and I'm concerned. I come to you and say, you know, my daughter, 16 years old, just came to me and said she's pregnant. She thinks she's three months pregnant. And less than three weeks ago, I went to another doctor who said she has Addison's disease. And my God, for the last year and a half, we've been dealing with her and an eating disorder. She won't maintain weight. And right now, I'm really concerned. This is my grandchild. Doc, should, do I have a reason to be concerned? What would you say to me? Firstly, Montel, I would say to you, congratulations on being really concerned. That's step one in protecting your child and your future grandchild. Be concerned, be involved, ask questions, and every other step is impossible without that. So step two is recognizing what an eating disorder means. It means that your daughter has nutritional deficiencies, vitamin deficiencies, uh, is not able to produce for her body sustenance for life, is not able to perform daily activities so that her calories and her nutrition would have to be monitored. She has to learn to love, enjoy being healthy and vital and strong as opposed to wanting to shut her body down. She is putting two lives in jeopardy as of 12 weeks ago. So we're already, as you said, we're, we're into this. We're not thinking about embarking upon this. We're in the middle of this. And each week she is taking risks that would involve the life of the fetus, as you said, miscarriage, premature delivery, low birth weight, 
and stillbirth. I'm nervous about the test results of what they're going to see, what they're going to look for. It's going to be hard for her to understand what she's hearing. She's so nervous. Hi, Emily. Hi. I'm Dr. Emerson. What we're going to do since Emily is the patient today, we're going to take her back. Emily, come with me. We're going to just take a look at what you completed. Okay. Are there any other medical conditions that you're under treatment for? Well, I want you to know that you're not being judged. A while ago, I was treated for an eating disorder. I'm very glad that you have the courage to share that with me today. An eating disorder and pregnancy are not mutually compatible, and it places the pregnancy at high risk. We will be doing a few tests today, and we'll be following these results as you move through the pregnancy. We're going to be looking at your blood pressure. If your blood pressure falls, then that means the baby is also not getting an adequate blood supply. Without it, the baby cannot maintain life. We'll be doing blood tests today. If those blood tests are not normal, there's the potential that the baby's heartbeat, even this early, would not be normal. We're going to do a sonogram. That will allow me to look at the heartbeat of the baby. Any problems could result in the development of significant disabilities that would follow the child through life. We got the results and the blood work revealed what, Doc? Well, Montel, it revealed that Emily had slight abnormalities of her electrolytes. And as you know, Gatorade is water and electrolytes. Mm -hmm. So our electrolytes are what allow us to, again, function and adjust as we move through life. We don't stay in a bed all day. We don't sit in one position all day. And so it's important that and she... Which is what she does do from time right, to time. That's what she does. She stays she in bed She doesn't have the strength right. gotcha. or the energy to get through a day. And we can't figure out whether or not it's Addison's or eating disorder, but we probably lean more yeah. towards the eating disorder for the fact that she's getting medication for the Addison's. And they're interrelated, Montel. Gotcha. The one worsens the other, and as you said, then the pregnancy takes that exponentially multiplied in risk factors both for Emily as well as for the unborn baby. How about her vitamin deficiency? She has definitely grave... Has. Grave. G-R-A-V-E. Grave vitamin deficiency. She's put on a couple of pounds, but she needs to put on some weight right now. She needs to... What else? Correct, Montel. She already is completing one of the three trimesters of her pregnancy. So starting off with self-destructive behavior and moving through one trimester in that fashion greatly affects the baby's ability to have the cells expand. The brain and the spinal column have developed already. And so it is the time for her to put her body in a position of sustenance. Her calories need to be monitored. Her nutrition needs to be balanced. She needs to be weighed. She needs to meet certain criteria with her weight. Already, for the conclusion of the pregnancy, this will be a high-risk pregnancy. That now is not changeable. So we have to be very active and very involved. Each year, 115,000 babies are born in New Jersey. 95% of the time, their umbilical cord bud, which is a rich source of stem cells, is discarded as medical waste. A new state law is designed to change that. NJN News Health and Medical Correspondent Sarah Lee Kessler has the story. Since November, there's been a law here in New Jersey requiring doctors and hospitals to inform expectant mothers about the benefits of cord blood banking. The evidence is there. And the statistics are showing that the likelihood is that one in about 150 people will use the cord blood by the age of 50. Dr. Free A. Emerson, an OBGYN in Hackensack, thinks banking cord blood is a moral imperative. In our National Marrow Registry program, we have 70% of patients not able to find a match at all, and those patients will die, and we are continuing to throw placenta and umbilical cord blood into the garbage. Sounding beautiful. Women who opt to save or donate their baby's cord blood are required to bring a collection kit to the hospital. Sarah Lee Kessler, NJN News, Allendale.